there are two possibilities I see here. Either A, journalists, R&D employees, civil servants, pollsters, etc. are all scientists, or these projects are not science. A doesn't make much sense to me since basically everyone would be deemed a scientist at a certain point in time, so I chose B. In fact, if we compare the various characteristics that are present in the numerous definitions of science that can be found online and in other reference materials, several of these characteristics are simply absent from some social science projects. Um, we see them here. Uh, for example, there is lack of hypothesis testing. When asked on our forums for their research hypotheses, the applicants sometimes do not provide any hypothesis, or they come up with hypotheses that are extremely vague and general, such as people will have more fun doing something that they choose to do and that they like. So it is based on common sense, and the outcome can be predicted with almost certainty without even conducting the project. So there is often confusion between a hypothesis and an opinion. Also, there are no variables sometimes. Applicants do not seem to know what a variable is, and there is confusion between variable and topic. Uh, for example, uh, an applicant will say, our variable is the battered woman syndrome, which in fact is the topic, not a variable. Even worse is that there are many instances where there is no or little systematicity visible in the design. Even though most people agree that the science method involves both observation and experimentation, these projects are often limited to simple observation. When there is a methodology, there are frequent flaws in the design and in selecting participants, in excluding variables, etc. But that doesn't seem to matter, and I will mention why in a minute. Here are three examples from different disciplines, so real cases again. Um, theology, education, and linguistics, so I'm going beyond the borders of social sciences. The example in theology uh, is uh, the person who wanted to implement a new process for a sacrament and to measure its effectiveness by looking at how people smile at children's look on their faces. In the field of education, there is this teacher who wanted to investigate the effectiveness of a new communication system in class. Um, the hypothesis being that when the teacher uses the talk board, she would communicate more with the students. But the problem was that the researcher was the one and only teacher, so the only thing he or she has to do is just talk more when using the board, thus confirming their hypothesis. And in the field of linguistics, there is um, another person who wanted to um, verify the hypothesis that news anchormen in France have a higher pitched voice than French-speaking anchormen in Quebec, comparing five from each place. When asked about the selection criteria um, for France, he or she said simply that um, he chose these five people because he noticed that they have a high pitched voice. The typical pattern for the less scientific projects in social sciences that I see is one that is entirely qualitative, with very few participants. I must specify here that my observations are limited to projects involving human participants. Now, imagine a friend who tells you that Canadians are rude. You ask him why, and he says that he has met one Canadian in the past and that person was rude. Even the layman on the street would instinctively say that you need more people to generalize. But what is obvious to the layman is not always obvious to some researchers who will generalize based on data from a handful of participants. So as I just said, typically the projects are largely qualitative. Among the projects in social sciences that I have examined, less than 10% have a quantitative component. The typical case is having between 8 and 15 people and using a semi-directed interview with open-ended questions plus some which will be made up on the spot depending on what the respondents will say. But isn't that what a reporter does? You prepare a bunch of questions and follow your inspiration for the rest? This being said, I have nothing against qualitative research. On the contrary, I even worked on the TCPS chapter on qualitative research. 
Qualitative research can be a precious ally to quantitative methods or be used alone in an efficient manner. But used alone with very few participants, it will tend to yield data that cannot be generalized. Describing and explaining phenomena is hardly sufficient for scientificity, since any explanation can be very superficial. For example, there is uh, a fellow researcher who concluded that the X and Y populations were disappointed because they do not benefit from the reforms. It is an explanation, but is it scientific? In other cases, the hypothesis and or its explanation are pure speculation. I am reluctant to label such studies as science. This is probably why the notions of reliability, validity, etc., do not seem to be considered by some researchers, since they do not expect their study to be replicated, neither their data to be verified. In fact, we see that in most cases, the applicants announce to the committee their intention to destroy their data as soon as the study is over or shortly after. This goes against recommendations that data be conserved for a reasonable amount of time, for example, the APA, American Psychological Association, suggests that data be kept available for a minimum of five years after the date of publication, in case fellow researchers challenge the analysis or the handling of the data. There have also been calls for replication standards in the American Sociological Review. In summary, I see a lot of studies that I consider to be documentaries polls, and program evaluations that are misrepresented as scientific research. To me, a useful starting point for our research ethics committees would be to reconsider using the criterion of applicability and or generalizability. So in terms of verifying and or creating hypotheses, theories, etc., despite their disappearance from the TCPS. Of course, this criterion will have to be refined considerably to become an efficient means of separating scientific from non-scientific research. For sure, one could argue that the fact that the research be scientific is not that relevant to ethics committees. As long as there is research taking place involving human participants, those should be protected. Yes, but the point is that, that it's a breach of ethics to involve participants for pointless endeavors. I think we should not waste people's time in making them believe that the study will serve science when it can be easily be predicted not to be the case. It would be too simple to say that social sciences are not scientific and that natural sciences are real science. Several studies in social sciences that I have examined are sound and well designed, and no doubt that several studies in natural sciences could be labeled as non-scientific. In fact, the view expressed here, akin to uh, that adopted by Ohu, implies that the scientific nature of any research should be based on the process that is taking place and not on the topic that is being investigated. This way, research in social sciences could be either scientific or non-scientific based on what the researcher does, not on what he or she investigates. Thank you.